So welcome to ATC Emergency Medicine Channel. Uh, today we are discussing about a young male who came to ear with complaints of acute onset breathlessness. Okay. Should begin, sir. So a 24 year old male came to ear with complaints of acute onset breathlessness since that day evening. Uh, so on arrival, on my initial 10 second assessment, he was conscious or in order to make amends. I went to the primary survey. His airway appeared to be patent. There was no signs of any airway obstruction. There was no audible stridor, gurgling or pulling of secretions. The respiratory part, he had a respiratory rate of 28 per minute, but he was maintaining saturation of 99% in room air. On auscultation, he had bilateral uh, equal air entry, but with bilateral uh, extensive wrong cave was heard on all lung fields. So immediately I started him on, uh, initially on O2 and arranged him to uh, give some nebulization with uh, duolin, which is a combination of liver salvatamol and ipratropium bromide. And then we went to the circulatory part. Uh, what is the difference between duolin, uh, sorry, hmm. ipratropium bromide and uh, uh, salbutamol? Uh, Salbutamol is basically a beta 2 agonist, uh, mainly it acts on the smooth muscle for relaxation. Mm. And Protropic Bromide is again, but it's an anti cholinergic. Okay. Uh, it can also uh, uh, produce uh, smooth muscle relaxation. How do they uh, differ in terms of the airway? The, the site is in the. Mm, the site of action is different. Okay. Uh, mainly the Protropic acts on the larger, uh, smaller, uh, smaller airway. airways and uh, this thing. Uh, Salbutamol acts on the, on the larger, larger airways. airways. Okay. So, in mm. asthma, which is better? Uh, asthma actually um, more asthma different. is a predominant condition which involves larger uh, airway or smaller airway? Larger airway. Larger airway. Mm. COPD is? COPD is smaller, small, smaller smaller airway. airway. But mm. uh, uh, in a given case both can be involved but mm. predominantly it is because actually large standing wrong uh, asthma usually go in this age of COPD. Okay. What are the side effects of uh, these mm. uh, nebulizations? Uh, mainly palpitation secondary to salbutamol. Salbutamol. Palpitation and? Uh, Hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. So, mm. hypokalemia related issues like mm. muscle cramps, mm. uh, muscle pain, mm. all these things can be there. And you told uh, mm. palpitation can be there, mm. tachycardia can be there. Mm. Okay. And some people will be more prone to this symptom. Hypotropium, what is the side effect? Dryness. Dryness. Dryness of mouth. Mm. Okay. Okay. So initially started him on this combination of dual, and there is 1.25 mg of liver salvatamol with 500 mg of hypotropium bromide. So with the nebulization ongoing, we uh, continued our primary survey. Uh, heart rate is 87 per, uh, per minute and BP record was 140 by 80 mm. millimeters of mercury. Mm. Uh, disability part had a full score of GCS. Mm. And then we went to the secondary survey. What is Pulse's paradoxes? Um, it happens in case of cardiac tamponade. Only in cardiac tamponade. And muscle pneumothorax. Only in pneumothorax. Uh, yeah. Then? Any severe respiratory mm. distress, it can occur, mm. including your cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax. And severe asthma and severe COPD exacerbation also, you can get similar finding. Mm. Okay. So on reassessment, actually, uh, he is now currently ongoing with nebulization and is symptomatically getting better. So we went okay. with the uh, secondary survey. How do you get nebulization in a acute mm. breathlessness condition? Uh, nebulization, basically, the nebulizer actually comes in usually in a uh, 3 ml respule, okay. uh, which we have to uh, place it in a nebulizer container and uh, we have to start on O2 at around uh, 6 to uh, 8 ml, okay. or 8 liters of O2. Okay. Basically, if we are uh, giving more O2 or less O2, the droplet size can be actually go smaller or bigger, it okay. won't be that effective. Okay. So, our preferred is 6 to 8 liters per minute. Okay. How many nebulizations you advise in a patient who is having acute breathlessness? Uh, usually, actually, we can give like in intermittently, like in every 30, 20 minutes, we can give back to back or okay. you can give a continuous simplification over one hour. Okay. Which is actually depending on the patient's symptoms you can okay. give. So in this patient actually we were planning to give like every 20 minutes one dose was planned. So currently the first dose is ongoing and we went with the uh, secondary survey. So basically patient is a known case of asthmatic uh, but had only had intermittent episodes. But recently he had a history of COVID infection about uh, three weeks back. Okay. Uh, it was uh, not very severe, he was doing home content only, but uh, following that he had uh, more uh, recurrent episodes. Mm -hmm. So he has been taking Seroflow 250 uh, rotor caps he has been taking. Seroflow contains? Uh, Seroflow contains uh, Salmetrol and uh, this thing. Um, um, Proticus. Uh, Proticus. Salmetrol is a? Uh, long acting. Uh, long acting. Mm. Beta agonist. Okay. What is the difference between salmetrol and formatrol? 
Formatron is actually got two actions. That one is actually it has got a again acute onset along with the long acting. Okay. So basically, it can be used both both as a both if we can and along with that we can use it for long acting prophylaxis. Where is Salmatron? Salmatron will take some more time to act. Act. So mm. acute action is not there. Mm. So Salmatron should not be used in acute acute hours. hours. Mm. It is only a preventive drug. Mm. Whereas Formatron is an acute. It is used for both acute attack and okay. also prophylaxis. Okay. So this patient has been taking uh, this thing, sort of flow 250 uh, occasionally whenever he is having acute episodes. Okay. But of course, uh, post COVID, uh, actually he is having uh, more frequent episodes. Okay. So that's the history, and actually uh, that day around afternoon time he had an acute uh, worsening of the symptoms, mm -hmm. and so he immediately came to the hospital. And then he doesn't have any non-allergic history, but he has got some history of allergy to dust and pollen. And his uh, medication only taking is sort of flow. No other drug. What is the commonest trigger for asthma? Uh, it could be like um, yeah, commonest like, trigger, environmental allergens like pollen, dust, or excess. Dust pollen. only. In dust, mm. something is there that is commonest mm. trigger. It mm. is dust mite. Mm. Dust mite. mite is one of the commonest trigger for asthma. Mm. But uh, dust is the, the like when we tell it is dust, mm. but it contains an organism that is dust mite. Dust mite. It is the commonest uh, trigger mm. for asthma. Mm. Then other young people usually could be ex secondary exercise or exercise induced asthma. Okay. Mm, then maybe some drugs they are taking like NSAIDs or something can okay. induce asthma. Uh, this guy mainly had an issue of like history of dust and pollen allergy in the past. Mm. Then also mother is also an asthmatic. Okay. Uh, medications he's only taking sort of flow. No other medications okay. he's taking. Uh, there's also no past surgical history as such. Only recent medical How history. How do you know clinically this is COPD? <coughs> this mm. is one case is COPD. Another case is asthma. Mm. In emergency room, we get uh, acute breathlessness. Mm. History-wise, how do you differentiate it is asthma and COPD? Uh, COPD usually will be long-standing. Okay, it's progressive of... disease. Mm. Asthma is? Asthma is actually usually in early young, uh, young onset. Like asthma, asthma is mm. young onset. Other mm. one is uh, uh, late, late onset. Late onset. Yeah. Can uh, you get then... late onset asthma? No, that's also possible. It's also possible. Mm. So that is not a ex all cases. You don't get like that. Mm. But normally, it is mm. young onset, mm. other one is uh, late, late onset. onset. Then, main is reversibility. Asthma is uh, reversible. fully reversible. COPD is? Uh, it's only partially, partially reversible. reversible. Progressive. Mm. Okay, then. Uh, then Family history is? Family history is more in case of asthma. asthma. Like history of atopia, allergic history. And okay. history and okay. Smoking history is? Smoking history more common in COPD. More in COPD, less mm. in asthma. Then. Mm. Uh, then recurrent exacerbations are also most common in COPD. Okay. Uh, Infective exacerbations are more common in COPD. COPD. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, then again, uh, last meal was around uh, previous uh, pre that day morning was eight or eight thirty. Why you are uh, mm. discussing about last meal in emergency room? Uh, this patient is not that significant, but actually, if a patient is going into severe respiratory distress and we are planning to intubate, okay. uh, like a full stomach or like an empty stomach can make a difference. Okay. Uh, so. And the only event actually, the contributing was actually uh, he went for an evening walk after the, uh, lunch. Then only he developed this acute breathlessness. Okay. I know he may have acute uh, asthma episodes after mm. exercise. Mm. Secondary to exertion, maybe. Like uh, so, on clinical examination, he's a moderately built and nourished male. Uh, no other signs, no pickle, no, no paleoectral cyanosis or clubbing. Respiratory he had extensive long game bilaterally, which has been improving after our second nebulization. Okay. And symptomatically, also, he's getting better. Uh, cardiovascular sign, uh, uh, no murmurs were heard. Uh, uh, S1S2 was heard. What are the causes for uh, uh, V's in a patient? Uh, v is uh, most common is bronchial asthma, uh, then mm. it could be due to foreign body upper airway obstruction. Can, not upper airway, upper airway but obstruction will not produce, will not produce V's. Yeah. v's. Mm. That produces? Uh, the, this thing, um, strider. Or, strider. Mm. What is the difference between strider and V's? Uh, strider is mainly an upper airway uh, high frequency. Mm. Uh, what is the difference? V's will be again high frequency, but it will be originally from the lower airways. How do you know that? Uh, we can actually place a stethoscope on the. Uh, mm. That is a fixed sound. Mm. Strider is a fixed sound. Mm. It will not change its character. Mm -hmm. But VC is not a fixed sound. It can change in its character. Mm. Strider heard both in inspiration and expression. Mm. V is heard predominantly in inspiration. In oh. Rarely get an expiratory V also. Mm. Okay. okay. Mm. 
other systems with their normal limits. Uh, so on reassessment, now actually the patient actually even after second evaluation, he was complaining of some breathing difficulty. Okay. Uh, so we gave one a hydrocortisone, hundred milligram was also given. Okay. And then we ordered for a third IV. IV was given. And then Is we the IV and oral are same or different? Uh, effectivity wise, both are same only. Okay. But we initially had put an IV line, so we went with a okay. IV line. IV in hundred milligram hydrocortisone. And we also ordered for a third uh, round of this thing. Uh, nebulization dueling along with that we also given one beauty cord nebulization also okay so after about uh, 45 to 1 hour actually symptoms uh, improved very much beauty cord is uh, beauty sun right when it will act uh, when you give a nebulization of beauty sun mm. when it will reach its action uh, usually the uh, action will uh, take around for 3 to 4 hours uh, mm. nebulize beauty sun right it will take uh, minimum 2 weeks to act 2 weeks, two weeks. IV uh, steroid you are given, uh, it will take 4 hours, six hour, four to 6 hours, six hours. Mm. but we are only preventing the further episodes, mm. we are given an injection, we, then we may start an oral tablet mm. and we start uh, nebulized, mm. once the patient is uh, discharged, we will be putting on uh, inhaled steroids, mm. so that bridging time is uh, this one, you are okay. giving nebulized, mm -hmm. so it will never act immediately, mm -hmm. we should understand. Mm. So after our third cycle, actually, yes, symptomatically much improved. Uh, so we observed for some time. Uh, so since the symptoms have improved, we actually planned him for discharge. Okay. Uh, on discharge, actually, we uh, since we considering his symptoms, we discharge him with oral uh, steroids. Okay. Uh, Vistron was given uh, 40 milligram uh, at night for about five days. When will you give steroid in your practice? Uh, thing is actually depending on the symptoms. Uh, when will you give steroid? You want to give steroid in this patient who is asthmatic, definitely we will give. Mm -hmm. When is the ideal time for steroid, whether it is IV, oral, whatever it is? Uh, depending on the classification. like uh, uh. This is in the morning hours. Mm. Unless you are giving a replacement dose. Replacement is given in adrenal insufficiency, you have to give BD dose. You are giving an anti-inflammatory dose, it has to be, immediately you will give. Mm. But daily if you are giving, it has to be morning. Why? Mm -hmm. If you give in the night, what will happen? When is your uh, 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 like uh, axis of steroid uh, release, uh, steroid release in your body? What time? Uh, peak time will be in the morning. Early six, morning. Uh, six o'clock. Early morning. Uh, so early morning, six. our body will release steroid. Mm. By next day, early morning, it will mm. subside. Mm. Okay. If you are giving steroid in the morning, it is like a physiological uh, mm -hmm. dose. Mm -hmm. If you are giving in the night, what happens? It will suppress next day steroid release. So if you give at least uh, four, four or five days, the normal steroid release from our body will be mm -hmm. reduced or it will be altered. Mm -hmm. So that physiological access you are blocking. So mm -hmm. never give a steroid in the night, night hours unless there is indication. If the patient mm -hmm. is having hypotension due to uh, adrenal insufficiency, you can give. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, don't give. Mm -hmm. So morning hours are the best hours to give steroids. Mm -hmm. Morning before food or after food? Uh, after food. After food. Mm. Okay. So this patient actually uh, we are advising. So how do how uh, much steroid do you advise for this patient? Uh, forty milligram. First. Why forty milligram? Uh, usually we give forty to sixty milligram. What is the dose? See, you may be mm. seventy mm. kg. She may be fifty kg. Uh, Should have some value, no? Mm. Per kg body, one one to two okay. milligram per kg body weight is. Mm. Ideal dose of uh, steroid should be started initially, then mm. you can reduce it. Like mm. suppose you are starting 1 milligram, it can be 60 mg or 70 mg. Mm. Okay. 40 milligram may be a smaller dose, but mm. it's okay. So he is having only mild mm. symptoms. symptoms. But we should know what is the ideal dose of steroid mm. to be started in acute condition. Mm. So 1 to 2 milligram per kg body weight, mm. depending on the severity. Here mm. we can give at least 1 milligram per kg body weight. Mm. Okay. Mm. How many days you continue steroids? Uh, Non-tapering we can give 3 to 5 days. No. Non-tapering up to 2 weeks you can give. Mm -hmm. Up to 2 weeks no need to taper at all. Mm -hmm. You can suddenly withdraw the steroids. Mm -hmm. If you are continuing after 2 weeks for a uh, indefinite time or a prolonged period, mm -hmm. then you need to taper. Okay. Suppose in asthma normally we give only 1 week. You can immediately withdraw the uh, steroid. Mm -hmm. If the patient is on steroid for a long time, mm. like patient was on steroid, we have put him on higher dose of steroid, then we cannot uh, withdraw the steroid directly. Mm. 
in an acute settings like this, we, we want after one week you can definitely withdraw, we stop the stop. drug yeah. or withdraw the drug. Yeah. Okay. Along with that, we also advise the patient to like for at least for now change the this thing, drug from salmatol and this thing, salmatol yeah, to. You are told about steroid. You ah. complete that. Ah. You started. I used gave IV steroid. Mm. We started oral steroid. Mm. Anything else to be continued? He is ah. asthmatic. asthmatic. It's an inflammatory condition. Mm. So what else you start for this patient? Uh, this thing also uh, Montelukast. No, here no. you have to give. Uh, inhaled uh, steroid. Uh, uh, Whether you give a combination or not, you uh, have to tell inhaled steroids are required. Yeah, we, uh, so, fluticasone is an ideal drug which mm. can be started in first week itself. Mm. So, it will act by two weeks, it, its action will occur mm. and you can uh, withdraw the st oral steroid. Mm. So, you have to start it. Mm. Suppose you are planning to give, you have to give. Mm. Okay. According to step, step okay. up the therapy, you have to start and you can uh, mm. see what happens. Okay. So basically, since the patient was already on serum flow, actually we advise it to change to advise to change to uh, this thing, uh, formatrol plus formatrol with the budazone. Budazone right? combination. Okay. Uh, so that was advised to be taken and taken continuously for the next at least a uh, few weeks. Okay. Uh, since the sub, uh, symptoms subside. Okay. So wow. according to the actually the uh, GINA guidelines, uh, the Global Initiative for Asthma, we can actually classify the asthma like intermittent asthma or like mild moderate or persistent asthma. Okay. So intermittent will be like any less than uh, two episodes per week, and mild intermittent will be, <coughs> mild persistent will be like more than two per week, hmm. and moderate will be like almost every day he'll be having symptoms, and okay. severe will be like very bad okay. asthma. So. In the mild, actually, we can ask them to take occasionally, we can send them with a short time. How do you assess the severity? What is the way to assess the severity? Uh, one thing is history-wise, and secondly, on clinical assessment, actually, we have to check the forced expiratory. Uh, if you want, we have to check. How do you check it? Uh, basically, after a deep inspiration, mm -hmm. we ask them to deeply ex exhale, and in the first second, the volume is calculated yes. using a flow metric. Okay. We not in emergency room. Not in emergency room. Emergency room, we cannot check the mm. uh, severity of asthma. Only mm. we can know history wise or saturation you can see. Mm. But it has to be mm. done by a pulmonologist by PFT. Mm. PFT. FPV1 should be mm. uh, calculated. Calculated. Mm. What is the normal FPV1 in a person? Normal person. Like you do mm. FPV1. What will be the FPV1? Usually above, above, 80. Be above, 80. above 80. 80. Above 80 is considered as normal. Mm. Okay, in asthmatic patients, what happens? Usually, be around seventy, like that. In the mild. Right, it can uh, be uh, like less than sixty, less less than mm. forty, or like uh, mm. less than twenty, like that. It will be according to severity. It can be reduced. So okay. mild will be more uh, around um, more than uh, seventy, hmm. and about uh, forty to 60, seventy will be like uh, in a moderate. More less than forty uh, will be less severe. than would be severe, and very severe will be less than twenty five. Okay. Mm. So how do you diagnose asthma in PFT? Uh, main thing is actually reversibility. Uh -huh. After oh, the what? after the initial BF, uh, this thing uh, FA one, we give a bronchodilator. So you have to tell the patient to come back after two weeks, and mm. you have to send the patient for a PFT. Mm. On that day, patient must not take that nebulizer or mm. uh, inhaled uh, <coughs> this one, fluticasone. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but uh, oh, formatrol. formatrol. Then you do a FA one. Repeat assessment. Repeat mm. after. Uh, after giving nebulization. After giving salbutamol nebulization. Mm. Okay, so reversibility can occur. Mm. What should be the reversibility in asthma? What is uh, the reversibility percentage in asthma? Mm. What can be the in COPD? Uh, More than 15% reversibility if it is there mm. in FEV1, then it is mostly asthma. Mm. That is a significant reversibility. Okay, mm. if it is less than 15%, it can be a irreversible problem. Mm. Okay. Then. Okay. So this patient actually we give an oral steroid mm. along with uh, uh, this thing, a formatrol plus budesonide combination was advised mm. and then advised to review in pharmacology for further. Okay. Follow. Do you want to give Montelukast? Mm, what is Montelukast? Uh, Montelukast? You are told about Montelukast. Uh, yeah. Basically, it's a leukotriene inhibitor, mm. uh, and in, in mild cases, actually, we can give it in uh, instead of uh, this thing, uh, inhaled steroids. Okay. Mild uh, cases, you can start. Mm. Okay. So, but mainly it can be used to prevent further exacerbations. Okay. So, even if we are giving it together also, it's fine. So, okay. we, this patient, we actually, since we are having extensive dystology and all that, we actually started a model first also. Okay. Can we give antihistamines in this patient? Antihistamines? Uh, okay. Like chlorofentrimin, malate, cetracin, fexofenadine, can we give? Mm, fexofenadine can also actually reduce exacerbations. Like, you know. Yeah. It is not recommended in acute episodes. What yeah. happens if we start fexofenadine in an asthma patient? Sedation. No, sedation is good, no? Mm -hmm. 
hexafenidine as such will not produce hello mm-hmm. second generation mm-hmm. le- but some patients will mm-hmm. come in but what is the problem of uh, this uh, chlorpheniramine malate cetras in uh, hexafenidine in acute episodes um what happens to the secretions if you start okay. this type they can dry up the secretions it can cl- completely dry up the secretion mm. so it should not be started in acute episodes once mm. the patient is stabilized mm. to prevent uh, further episodes you can try mm. after one week or some mm. like that okay mm. not in acute episode we should never start mm. fexofenadine in a admitted patient in hospital mm. okay mm. then what about uh, magnesium sulfate and that's also we can be given uh, given severe asthma don't tell we can give it tell yeah. me the indications the uh, indication actually uh, there is no indication for magnesium sulfate in acute asthma mm-hmm. but some papers have uh, reported that there is mm-hmm. improvement in their mm-hmm. uh, repeated admissions but mm-hmm. the actual uh, mechanism we don't know mm-hmm. what is the mechanism of magnesium sulfate in bronchioles or uh, airway tract there mm-hmm. is a mechanism it will dilate it it's a bronchial dilator. dilator basically yeah. it's a bronchial dilator but mm. it is not proven that it alone it will not help mm. but it has shown that uh, repeated admissions in copd patient can be prevented by mm. magnesium sulfate but mm. it is not a, a single stand alone treatment mm. it is an adjunct therapy mm. okay mm. what happens to the potassium in patients who is having asthma or copd usually will be low uh, if you are giving multiple nebulizations and uh, otherwise it will not be low you have seen so many cases of asthma mm. and you see the abg report uh, you'll, you'll see many patients without nebulization itself it will be low mm. why it is like that mm. where is potassium used in our body where it is used huh? it is used for what need for a muscle muscle contraction, muscle contraction so yeah. if a patient who is having severe breathlessness they will be continuously no, using potassium be, uh, so potassium loss is known in asthma patient or copd patient even without salbutamol mm-hmm. so you can have hypokalemia in most of the patients mm-hmm. okay what happens if you don't correct it the patient can go to early muscle fatigue response muscle fatigue, fatigue. then you mm-hmm. may have to intubate the they patient for the failure mm-hmm. okay so in that case also magnesium is very important why mm-hmm. it is like that is like magnesium basic. and co- um, as a Hypo- uh, potassium got some relation uh-huh. okay unless until you correct the magnesium deficit the potassium uh-huh. correction will not occur so uh-huh. that you have to correct uh-huh. okay then what else you have to advise the patient on discharge uh, one thing is to avoid what are the preventive uh-huh. you have started formatrol with the budasone uh-huh. combination uh-huh. with some uh, amondilucca something like that uh-huh. oral steroids uh-huh. then what else you advise <coughs> mainly to like avoid triggers avoid a trigger basically each person okay. will be having some sort of trigger which triggers. most okay. probably they'll be knowing like okay. this interest uh, like exercise induced okay. whatever so that is uh, one thing mm. how do you treat ex- exercise induced asthma uh, we what advice you give better to actually patient? take a dose before going okay. to the exercise okay. that is correct mm. then what else you advise the patient mm. what are the advices you give to the patient who is having uh, asthma who you admitted in emergency room you are discharging on the same day mm. Uh, one is triggers should be avoided mm. second yeah. is actually always carry the drug like about okay your, about yeah. your drug should be with the mm. patient mm. and suppose the patient is not able to like go for like a, have an access to hospital nearby in an acute asthma mm. you can actually uh, uh, take back to back three three shots of the same drug okay uh, for acute supportive care okay mm. So even if they are having only a prophylactic drug like a salmonella or something, they can uh, back to back take need uh, three doses. Okay. Which What is the action of uh, proton pump inhibitors and uh, mm-hmm. domperidone in asthma? Steroid induced. Oh. <laughs> It is not steroid induced. One of the commonest trigger of asthma is GERD. GERD. Mm-hmm. So in that type of is, patient is telling that history, mm-hmm. they have to be given on the uh, mm-hmm. PPI with the domperidone. Mm-hmm. And the steroid also, if we are giving steroid, it is better to give that. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell me something about spaces. Basically, uh, uh, the drugs that we give come in different uh, modalities which we can use, uh, give to the patient. Okay. Basically, we can give it as rotor caps. or as inhalers okay. inhalers will be coming as uh, compressed uh, like air, air chambers will be okay. spraying the droplets okay. but actually the patient have to sing with the uh, pressing of the inhaler same to, time patient has to uh, uh, take a proper take. inhalation then only the uh, drug will be effective 
So suppose it is a child or an old patient, he may not be able to do that properly. So we can advise something called a spacer. Mm -hmm. So after pressing the inhaler, the uh, drug will be contained within the spacer because it has got a negative, uh, this thing static. Uh, uh, that means it will not stick to the wall. Will not stick to, the stick to the uh, this thing content of the spacer. So the patient can take it his own uh, like time to take the uh, inhalation and get the drug inside. So basically, okay. adding a spacer to an inhaler can actually uh, give better this thing, drug okay. intake. Is there any difference between rotor caps uh, uh, or MDIs or nebulizer? Uh, basically, uh, rotor caps comes in small capsule which we can break into a chamber and inhale. Uh, it doesn't require that kind of a uh, inhala uh, inhalation thing. Uh, but in drug availability, is there drug availability is comparatively low because actually uh, uh, there is no difference no, not in low. drug availability of the mm. uh, different modalities of the treatment. But mm. there is definitely uh, there is a problem in uh, rota caps rota because cap. that that requires uh, some more. Uh, the or drugs can get stick to the okay. Mm. And uh, MDIs requires more. Expertise, but mm. if spacer is there, it is better. Mm. Nebulization, it is very, very easy. Mm. Anybody can take. Mm. Okay. Mm. That advantages are there with each modality, mm. but in drug availability, there is no mm. uh, major difference. Mm. And now we have uh, newer devices which can, we can automatically uh, deliver the drug with along with the inhalation without pressing the device. Okay. So basically, it can give more. Okay. Uh, Should we advise antibiotic <laughs> in this patient? <coughs> Antibiotic is not usually recommended in case of uh, exacerbation, except if there is a, some history of some recent history of fever or something, or we are suspecting some pneumonia or something like that, hmm. which we can confirm with the CBC or an X-ray, and then if any positive findings in there, we can start with antibiotics. Antivirals. Antivirals again, like any counterproductive history is there. If there is fever, <coughs> if there is symptoms of uh, viral fever, then hmm. we have to any give rhinorrhea fever. Like which which uh, viral infection is very common nowadays? Which can present with asthmatic episode, mm. which which is which has got a treatment plan. There are a lot of viral infection we cannot mm. treat. Ars COVID and H one N one. H one N one. H one N one is the most common mm. disease which can present with a, a asthmatic episode. Nowadays, mm. COVID also present with a, mm. uh, this type of problem. Mm. Okay, how was the patient after discharge? Uh, patient was actually observed for some more time after the nebulization, but he was quickly stable, so we discharged. Okay. Any patients uh, you need to give adrenaline in uh, uh, severe asthma? Uh, suppose the patient is having uh, severe persistent uh, breathing difficulty, even after continuous nebulization and mm -hmm. early management, we can give. What is the most uh, dangerous sign in asthma? Silent chest. Silent chest. Mm -hmm. If you are getting a silent chest, uh, you can give mm -hmm. nebulization of adrenaline, mm -hmm. subcutaneous adrenaline. These all are tried, but mm -hmm. it is not a. Definitive indication for adrenaline. Mm. Adrenaline definitive indication is something else. Mm. But you can try in emergency room, mm. you can give adrenal nebulization, mm. subcutaneous adrenaline in silent chest. Mm. Patient who is having silent chest. Mm. So we can give 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 milligram sub Q or IM can be given. Okay. About two to three doses can be given back to back 15 okay. 20 minutes later, like that. Okay. Mm. We need any other devices which to uh, which uh, can be tried in patients who is saying uh, even though not classically indicated actually NAV can be used in most patients with acute exacerbation high floxin uh, high floxin yeah, yeah. that can be tried mm. okay NAV where we use uh, uh, mainly in actually like an embedding failure like okay. patients having severe muscle fatigue and all that we can initially try an NAV to maintain the patient okay what type of diet you advise patient with asthma asthma, asthma and COPD mm -hmm. so the type of diet you advise to the patient who is saying ask because uh, patients mm. will be admitted in your ICU. Mm. You advise the diet. What is the type of diet? Low carbohydrate, high protein. So you have to give mm. low carbohydrate, low carbohydrate high and high protein, high protein diet protein. with high potassium diet. Mm. Okay, so all these things are important. Mm. What is the role of carbohydrate in carbon dioxide metabolism? Is there any role? Uh, exhaled uh, CO2 will be more in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide production is more. Carbon, carbon dioxide, mm. it is finally, ultimately, it is mm. uh, broken into carbon dioxide and water. Mm. So, so, if you're taking more carbohydrates, the more exhaled uh, carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide. It's especially in patients who are saying COPD, not mm. in asthma. Mm. Asthma, you have to avoid cold or uh, whatever allergy to the patient. Mm. And high potassium diets are always very, very important. Mm. Okay, anything mm. else you want to tell? Uh, so, uh, there are some danger signs actually if the patient is coming with red, like flags. red flags. 
uh, mainly actually the, the patient is coming with uh, like uh, is drowsy is okay. unable to like uh, ha- is not having adequate just excursions and suppose we are doing an abg and is showing like uh, type 2 failure and all that we have to think okay. about immediate in- uh, intubation and further management okay so even though actually mechanical ventilation is not a treatment for asthma we have to immediately intervene otherwise the patient might collapse so any okay. signs of impending respiratory failure like any uh, reduced respiratory efforts uh, and silent chest then pco2 retention uh, significant hypoxemia and all we have to go for early intubation and then continue with the other therapies okay so that be like in a case of very severe asthma mm-hmm. then in status asthmatic case we can try all other uh, like other options like adrenalin bicarbonate sulfate terbutalin and all can be tried terbutalin how do you give what is terbutalin uh, terbutalin is again like a, uh, i can act like a bronchodilator mm-hmm. uh, but as much as it relaxes mainly it is it can be given nebulization it can be given subcutaneous mm. everything uh, is same mm. like salbutamol mm. it can be given mm. okay can we give amino uh, um, amino amino filling can also is not usually recommended in case of asthma but mm. some of the patient is not able to like relieved by other medication we can give it amino filling is a very powerful bronchodilator what are mm. the actions of amino filling Uh, but it has got its own problem that's mm. why we, it is not recommended in any guidelines if you see amnaphilin is not there mm. it is because of its arrhythmogenic properties mm. but what is the action of amnaphilin what are the actions of amnaphilin it is not mm. single action in bron- bronchioles mm. what is the action a smooth muscle relaxation it dilates the mm. smooth muscle in mm. diaphragm what is the action mm. it improves the contraction of diaphragm mm. in cardiac muscle what is the action Uh, I increases the contraction so mm. it is useful in all type of asthma whether it is a respiratory asthma or cardiac asthma mm. it is useful but we are not using because of its arrhythmias mm. but how do you give uh, uh, this uh, aminophilin i say uh, infusion uh, how do you give infusion 24 hour infusion still many uh, doctors prefer to give mm. in copd mm. because uh, it is very use, mm. useful drug mm. if you can monitor the patient it mm. is useful but it is not there in the gina guidelines or Mm. gold guidelines it is not mentioned at all because of its side effect mm. how do you give it uh, continuous 24 hour infusion we can give mm. in uh, what medium mm. dextrose in dextrose. dextrose it should be given in dextrose mm. it should be given as continuous infusion mm. the patient develops any arrhythmia immediately stop the drug mm-hmm. so by monitoring only we have to give it otherwise mm. we should never give it okay mm. or okay. Mm. thank you thanks